further ado, here is Lee. Okay, am I, can you hear me? Okay, good. Uh, just a, a, a couple of things starting in. When I, when we first got started with this, one of the things that I thought was really, really important was that uh, East Texas is so underserved as, uh, as a subject for art in Texas. And our, I, you know, I don't know why that is because so much of what Texas is began here. And, and I'll address that a little bit more in the talk. But uh, it was very important for me in the process of doing this to be thinking in terms of how do we, how do I represent the, both the, you know, the landscape and the variety of the state of the, of the region of Texas, of East Texas, and, and, and kind of give people a reintroduction to what East Texas is as a, you know, as just a visual smorgasbord of all the wonderful stuff that uh, that it is and and so in the process of doing that I, I've concentrated on on three major things in terms of the of the pictures and those things are uh, the area in which I lived in rural Texas in eastern Walker County uh, called Dodge and the people and how they affected me and my vision of East Texas and uh, then just a, just a general look at the variety of the landscape of the state. And, and finally, uh, the, the people and places in terms of small towns and things like that. that so, so you'll see inside this, uh, the middle room here, there's, there's more in terms of architecture and uh, just references to the people of East Texas generally in this wall and around the corner you've got more references specifically to people that I knew in uh, in Dodge and the rest of the way around you've got just kind of the landscape the uh, generally speaking of Texas but as a as a piece of prologue one thing that I wanted to acknowledge is today is is uh, uh, San Jacinto Day, so we're we're marking the the day when uh, Sam Houston's army won the Battle of San Jacinto, and uh, that started with. Uh, and we like to think that that's part of a grand plan, but if Sam Houston's grand plan had gone according to plan originally. Uh, what you probably would have heard more about is a ferry that existed at this location. This is the easternmost place that you can get to in Texas by public roads. So if you go down to the bank of the San Jacinto there and you stand there, uh, what I was thinking when I was going that way was, oh, this would be cool. I can be in the easternmost place in Texas. I can be the easternmost Texan in in on Texas land, if I go stand in this spot in the on the Sabine River, and while I was there, I, I read the historical marker, and the and it pointed out that uh, this particular place and now the the name of the ferry Burr's Ferry uh, was where a crossing was across the Sabine, and uh, it was along uh, the Beef Trail. That was a place of regular commerce between uh, Spanish and Mexican Texas and, and then Louisiana. And during the runaway scrape, Sam Houston thought that it would be a good idea to make his way toward Louisiana by this crossing. And had he been able to do so and draw Santa Ana into the area to the east of the Natchez River, then in that territory would have been in disputed territory and General Gaines waiting on the other side of the Sabine could take his troops over and, and meet Santa Ana's troops and, and have a battle and, and uh, Texas would most likely have wound up as a part of the United States 
1836 instead of waiting until 1845. But as it happened, when they got to the, to the which way tree uh, on the way up toward this river crossing, uh, <laughs> Sam Houston's army would have none of this. They went down toward Harrisburg and that's how they wound up at, uh, at the San Jacinto. Another aspect as, as prologue is that East Texas is very much a seat of what Texas thinks about itself. Now this building uh, was built in the 18, early 1890s uh, on the campus of Sam Houston State Normal Institute, uh, now Sam Houston State University. And it was uh, the first and I think the grandest of the original main buildings for uh, the big, uh, for, for Texas state educational institutions. The, what was special about this particular place was that an awful lot of historians of early <laughs> Texas lived in the area around Houston. And uh, one in particular, uh, Anna Pennybacker, uh, was in the first graduating <laughs> class at Sam Houston Normal, and she wrote what was for about 40 years the, the classroom history of Texas that everybody learned from. Uh, so when, as in the early part of the 20th century, this book was written in 1888, and in the early part of the 20th century, as people in Texas learned about Texas history, they learned about it from uh, Pennybacker's uh, Texas history, and it was called a new Texas uh, history of Texas at the time. Uh, and one of the things that is interesting about that is that a probable source for much of the information in that history was uh, Joshua Houston, who had come to Sam Houston's household as a slave with his marriage to Margaret in 1841. Joshua was a remarkably intelligent and capable young man, and uh, in Sam Houston's absences, he gave him the, uh, the charge of his law office, where his library was. The library was filled with the classics, with law books, and all kinds of stuff. And Joshua wound up, after the Civil War, uh, he was a very prosperous uh, stagecoach driver, uh, blacksmith, and so forth. And as a result of that prosperity and the knowledge gained in uh, Houston's law office, he was able to uh, represent the region well as a state representative, uh, well after the protections of uh, Reconstruction had been withdrawn. He, he was last elected to the state legislature in 1888. Uh, so he was a remarkably well-respected person, wound up being on the boards of directors of four different churches in the Huntsville area. Uh, after the Civil War. Now, one point that I, you know, I have wanted to make with the show is that East Texas is a truly art-worthy place. It's got enormous variety, enormous visual variety. It's got, uh, you know, tremendous color and these towering forests and, and wonderful farms and fields and, and vistas and all kinds of stuff. And uh, just a lot of blessings of, of just natural art. Now, first three slides I'm gonna have in this segment are paintings that I did some years ago. They're not, uh, not represented in this show. They're already parts of others' uh, collections. And, but the, the point was that there are these, are, these are things that have been on my mind for a very long period of time that, 
this is a beautiful place that needs to be represented uh, to the people of Texas. And so you've got you know wonderful lakes and and places where people are are where there are animals and, and such to see. We have uh, farmland. This is a scene from uh, from actually right beside our house in Dodge, looking out toward the back and the sunrise. And uh, this is a scene from uh, 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 Lakeview Methodist Assembly <laughs> with, uh, it's just, you know, beautiful pine forests and, and uh, the nature as a place of uh, reflection where people go in and they can feel a spiritual oneness with uh, uh, with just the beauty of the space another thing that as i was thinking about as i dealt with putting this collection together it wouldn't when you start doing something in series you find out things about yourself that you don't necessarily <coughs> know you're going to find out about yourself uh, uh, the, this particular painting is one of a few paintings that I had been working on for for some time from a period about 10 years ago when uh, I had experienced a considerable emotional distress. And what, what I learned during that period of time was that uh, when I'm experiencing that kind of distress, uh, I actually see colors more brightly. So I experience more color when I'm when I'm depressed than I do when I'm happy and, and joyous yeah and it, <laughs> that's I, I think that's really unusual this uh, you know maybe this is just a particularly artistic thing so uh, this painting which is right there was from that period and and it's it is both it's both bright and colorful, uh, a sense of, of my joy in the space that I'm in, but it's also, uh, it's also done with a kind of agitated brushwork and, and uh, energy that you wouldn't generally see in my more pastoral landscapes. Now, the This emotional connection to places uh, also uh, goes to how, in particular spots, there are just so many associations. This also is an image uh, from Dodge. And whenever I would come back toward Dodge from, from Huntsville, looking from well down the road, you see Hopper's store off in the distance and that's kind of a kind of an icon of having arrived back at home but in the in the process of doing that i'm also finding myself in uh, in places where these momentous events have happened uh, to myself and to neighbors uh, that spot the spot from which this from which i generated this image is a spot where uh, my wife and younger daughter were involved in a head-on collision and fortunately they through her skillful driving she managed to avoid someone who had fallen asleep at the wheel uh, and and save them both but you know that's a that's an emotionally traumatic experience and to be in that spot is is filled with a, a sense of those emotions and so in the process of painting this you can see that and you can see that across the street there's 
uh, I didn't mention this in the narrative, but uh, a neighbor's house had burned down. He'd lost his home. Uh, looking back toward uh, toward Dodge, you see the the building that had been kind of the uh, social center of town for years and years and years, and it's it's also a place where my neighbor had. Uh, my neighbor's daughter had had her band, and I, you know, I'd always enjoyed hearing them uh, play. And then the fire department is past that, where I was one of the uh, where I was one of the founding members of the Dodge Fire Department. All these associations are in there together, and that you know, I don't know if you can I don't know if you can see that in the way it's painted, but it's. It's what the paintings come out of. Uh, this painting, that right there, is another of these emotionally entangled pieces. This painting took me uh, more than a decade to paint. It took me a good 12 years to paint from the point when I first started it. And at first I envisioned it as being this nice little pastoral pleasant scene uh, and what I didn't realize, and what, what it took me almost 10 years to realize, was that it had become emotionally entangled with a neighbor who lived at the, in the property that's immediately to the left of the image. Uh, uh, Gerald Price was a Houston police officer. He's in his 90s now. He's been retired for several decades. And he's... On, on the one hand, he is someone who is full of, his, of a love of God and a desire to serve God. And on the other hand, he's, he's got a kind of coarseness to him and uh, a kind of prejudice to him. And it's, he's, he is very typical of my experience of people of just country people in, in East Texas, that you've got things that we would consider contradictory, but they're contradictory in ways that are obvious to us, but not contradictory in ways that are obvious uh, to the people themselves. And yet, he is, he is an absolutely beautiful human being. Uh, and I, I found, when I realized that this painting was emotionally entangled with him, it helped me to understand what it was that I needed to do to it to make it work as a landscape. So instead of being this soft little shiny uh, landscape, I, I had to go back in and, and cut stuff out of it uh, and make it rough and coarse and, and very textural and in the, in, in the narrative, I, I said about it that uh, I felt like I was taking carpenter's tools to it, and, I'm, and there's, of course, a dual meaning to that, because in, in my mind, I'm thinking of, of Christ as a carpenter, too, that you know, you've got to cut stuff out, and it's, it was a painting that I said needed scars, and injuries to to be beautiful. Another thing that you'll see around uh, East Texas is you'll see all these evidences of the passage of time. Now, the typical one is to go past some farm, and and you see. Uh, several cars lined up and, and they'll be in the order of their model years. So you've got, you'll have a, a, a field off somewhere and there's a truck from the 40s and a truck from the early 50s and a truck from the late 50s and maybe a car from the early 60s or something like that. And <laughs> this is this is a regular feature of each of, of East Texas and I've i at first, I was really amused by it, but then I began, you know, it, it, I began to realize that this is, it's also an indication of people's, it, it's almost like uh, uh, totems 
of the passage of time that you see people going uh, you, you see people passing through their lives in the way they're they're setting up their automobiles so that the the vehicles themselves become in a sense time machines and uh, this this mercury comet up here really struck me uh, this is as uh, guy uh, Nichols back there pointed out to me early that this the location of this place is at a place called Barnes Switch which is on the highway up to uh, Crockett from Huntsville and so this guy has just collected a bunch of these cars that have been set out in, uh, in people's yards for years and years. But uh, this particular car uh, is a kind that I had always liked. When I, from the time I was a kid, I thought they were just really good looking cars. And it attracted me and I went up there uh, to take a look at it. And it turned out that on, on one of the front seats, there is a baby's car seat. And all of a sudden, I was, I was just struck by the idea that some poor mother had had, this, had a child with her and suddenly her car is not working. And that, that struck me as being like an experience that I had had about uh, 25 years ago when a car that uh, we, had, we had a a Plymouth K car. Anybody has ever had a K car? I'm so sorry. Uh, <laughs> but, but mine died by the side of the road and we were, we were coming up toward uh, 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 New Waverly and I had to get the kids out of the car, put the youngest on my shoulder, and just walk into town to, to get to a phone, because this was also before we had cell phones. But that, that experience of mine went back to this, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm projecting an image of my own experience on, on a woman whose grandchildren are grown. <laughs> so, I, you know, I have these experiences of uh, being in contact with something and they, they mean something so much deeper, they're icons of something so much deeper than just the object itself. Uh, another thing that I realized uh, in the process of doing the show uh, was that almost everything I do uh, it carries a lot of proxy baggage that it's that painting is meaningful because of Gerald Price uh, that painting is meaningful because of its relationship to my emotional life uh, and the painting back over there uh, is meaningful because I very intentionally went to this spot uh, looking to go to the big thicket uh, when when we moved out uh, when we moved to Dodge in 1984 I was still in my uh, middle 20s and you know when you're in your when you're in your 20s and, and earlier time is so much more compressed and a long time a year is a long time and three years is you know a really long time uh, my, my next door neighbor when we moved uh, to Dodge was a man named Baby Roark, uh, first name Edwin, but uh, he was the youngest of a group of like seven kids and had acquired the name Baby. I am I'm reasonably sure that he was aware of uh, an atrocity that happened in Dodge about a hundred years ago. On June 1st, uh, 1918, uh, there was a lynching in Dodge and uh, it was instigated by the Walker County Sheriff of all people. But in the process, uh, people from Dodge, including the person who was the Justice of the Peace there, named Sam Roark, who would have been 
a direct relation to my next door neighbor, uh, was involved, and the uh, the in the lynching, virtually an entire family was uh, was killed. Uh, this was a Cadmus family. It, you can you can find some references to it. Uh, it was written about in the New York Times. There was uh, it was taken up by Germany uh, in the closing months of World War One because it spoke to this hypocrisy about uh, about you know, citizenship in the United States, the protections of you know our, our noble protections of citizenship and so forth, uh, and. And Germany took it up as a cause of, of American hypocrisy, uh, hypo hypocrisy. So it also, when when I first moved out there, I I sensed that there was something about Dodge that seemed broken, and uh, it had it had not healed. There were. Uh, there had been a series of family feuds in the community over over many years, and uh, I found out that during World War II, now Baby was I mean, Baby was as bigoted as as any regular uh, East Texas country person might normally be. He he used to brag that he had never sat at table with a black person. But uh, I found to my surprise the only people who hated him were white. And the reason they hated him was because he had gone off during World War II to hide in the big thicket because he would not kill anyone. Now, to me, that's, that struck me as being a, a really strong indication that, that something had, a, had affected him powerfully. I think he knew, even though he was only three years old in 1918, I think he knew and saw what had happened to his family as a result uh, of, this, of this terrible event that they, the people had taken part. In. And he knew that killing was a, a terrible thing that left scars in you forever and ever. Uh, Baby died about three years after we moved to Dodge. And he was, his was the largest funeral I have ever seen uh, at First Baptist Church in Dodge. Uh, there, there were over 600 people there. The building only holds 400. It was it was really astonishing, the the love that he uh, that he engendered, and a lot of them were black. So I I thought that was a, a fascinating testimony to the man that he was. But because of that experience, I felt that I had to go to the big thicket and find this place that he had gone to to hide, and that's what. Uh, that's what that painting came from. I, is, I went to Big Thicket State Park. It's not a very good representation of Big Thicket. It's way more open than you would normally think of the place being. But uh, it wound up being the thing that, uh, the, the one image that struck me as being the most like what I wanted it to say because of this, this light that shines through it uh, in a place that that is full of hiddenness. And, and so that was, that was very intentionally my proxy portrait of Baby Roar. Uh, and you can, you know, there, there are things like that that happen in other images. Uh, a third aspect of my experience in, in doing the, the series of paintings was, uh, I've always thought of, I've always thought of uh, 
East Texas as being God's country. Uh, Guy and, and Adina and I all went to Lon Morris College together. Uh, one of our classmates was a fellow named Matt Item, and Matt, uh, who went on to become a Methodist pastor and is now the director at uh, uh, Lakeview Methodist Assembly, uh, the first time I met him, he was, he was talking about how uh, he, coming back to college, uh, he had stopped at all the, all the um, uh, historical markers on Highway 21 up toward uh, Alto. And I had seen how many of those were, and I thought that was, that was a genuine commitment to love of history uh, and also a healthy piece of eccentricity. But Matt, Loves, loves to say that, uh, that East Texas is God's country. That's right. <laughs> and, and I've always had that same feeling that East Texas is, you know, that it's, it's God's country. It's like a kind of paradise, but it's not, it's not like the idealized paradise that we carry around in our heads. It's it's a, it's a paradise that's more like what paradises really are. Uh, you, you always are looking back on a paradise to see what, what there was before that you were in love with. Or you're looking forward to a paradise. There's something that we're working toward that is going to be just wonderful. And so that, you know, a, our normal experiences of paradise are that they're never now. And with East Texas, it's also like that, that you've got, uh, you've got these many experiences where it's, there, there are wonderful things like, like my neighbors who are, they're partly broken people, but they're partly really beautiful people. And this, uh, this pier at Martin Dye State Park struck me as being kind of like that. It's the, you know, it's the place where you could go and you could go fishing and you could cast and, and your mind can go to that spot and do all kinds of, of wonderful things, but you can't actually walk there. <laughs> so, it was, this image was, was very much like what was going on in my, in my mind. And, and the paradises are almost never in the present. Uh, there's, there's, something about, there's something about any sort of beauty that if it's really going to be a deep and lasting beauty, it's, it can't be just perfectly beautiful. There's, there's something ugly and, and I was, in talking about this with some others, I was talking about, uh, I was talking about uh, movie stars, and you know, especially male movie stars. You think of Tony Curtis. It's not, he's, his, his face was not perfectly beautiful. John Wayne, not a perfectly beautiful face. And you can go through these people whose, whose faces were just wonderful on a big screen, and there's always an element of ugliness in them. Uh, this particular landscape is actually right behind the screen, and uh, it's a representation of, it, of a place where, that has just been harvested for pine trees. And in, as a representation of a paradise, it's, it's something of a, you know, it, it looks ugly, it, but it's got this, you know, nice little accent of bright color off in the distance. But what's wonderful about it is that it represents a kind of commitment over time. Uh, and most of the logging that's been done in East Texas historically, people just came along to, to uh, forests that had been there for a long period of time, and they, and they chopped down the trees, and they went off and went someplace else. But this is an actual tree farm, and there is 
there's a different kind of relationship with the land in a tree farm. It's really a farm, but it's also a place where you're not farming for what you can do over a summer, you're farming for what you can do over a generation or more. And, you know, that's a 30-year cycle of farming. So, this, this particular image is, uh, is a paradise where you're never really there until some moment 30 years off in the future. <coughs> but it's got an intergenerational commitment to that future. And that's this image right over here. Uh, paradises are often found in the midst of chaoses. Uh, my, my grandchildren had been looking, had been after me to find a tree that they could, they could climb in. And it took, you know, it took a, a certain sturdiness for it to be something that they could both get up and enjoy. And also, um, it had to be really close to the ground so they could, uh, so that I could, could actually get up into it. And uh, this one was provided by Hurricane Hardy. So my, and, and I remember instances like this when I was a kid where my parents would be thinking there was something awful going on. Desegregation comes to mind. When, when our schools were being desegregated, uh, my parents weren't opposed to desegregation. They were opposed to me sh being shipped off to a cotton field 11 mi miles out of town uh, to go to school. But it was, it was difficult for everybody. And for me, it was just an adventure. Well, for my grandkids, the aftermath of Hurricane Harvey was just an adventure. But for my neighbor, whose tree that was back in the back, uh, <laughs> It was, it was not an adventure, it was a whole lot of trouble. So, you know, some, your, your paradises are, are heavily influenced by the way, by the way you experience the, the situation that you're in. Uh, and there's a relationship between this image and that same theme. Uh, this is the Polk County Courthouse. Uh, I've, in my narrative, I, I note that uh, this, is, this is a place where you've got so many things coming together. I call it woven together. Where you've got transportation from all over uh, East Texas coming through town. There's immediately behind us on this image, there's a railroad track that, that crosses across the, uh, the the highway and then goes off to the right over here and you can't see it on on this particular uh, projection but there are metal uh, cross braces that come down from this building because it's been shaken so much by those trains over the years the without that without that transportation you there's so much that you can't there's so much that you can't do, so much that you lose, and yet with it, you know, it, it creates difficulties for people. This is also the county where my mother-in-law lived when she was, oh, six, seven, eight years old, and she loved the home in Livingston. <coughs> she thought it was wonderful. It was out on a farm. She had the best time of her life there. She would... Uh, all the whole time I knew her, she would uh, buy nostalgia magazines about living on the farm before World War II and, and so forth. Her parents remembered the same place as being a place of poverty and hard work and tremendous difficulty. So you've got, you know, there, there's the paradises that we see people experiencing are woven together sometimes with with hell and the the image that you see as you come in the front door this uh, is from uh, 
Mission Tejas State Park. And that's where uh, Texas actually gets its name. It's these Caduan Indians met the Spanish who were coming up there to establish a mission to show the French that they possessed this land. Uh, and so the, the mission gets started, the, the name, Teixas, that they, the word that they uh, spoke to the, friend, uh, to the Spanish, uh, meant friendship. And the mission itself didn't do a very good job of living up to the name. Uh, the Indians became so aggravated with the situation after about three years, and this was actually a pattern that you saw in numerous uh, Spanish missions in Texas that after, after about three years, the, uh, the Native Americans would be in an uprising and sometimes they would burn it down, which is exactly what they did with the, uh, with the mission. And, but, so we, you know, we've got this, we've got this place that is a vision on the one hand of uh, friendship being the foundation of our, of our uh, state. And on the other hand, it's, you know, we, it's difficult to live up to the, to the path of that sort of thing. And sometimes the paradise you seek is closer than you think. I, uh, I had been from the point when I started, uh, when I started trying to do this show, uh, one of the things that I wanted to do was to find a piece of, you know, really old woods. Uh, pine trees, like the ones we have here, generally will only live to be about 250 years old. So you don't necessarily have to go back to, uh, you know, woods that have never been cut before, but if you can find some woods that are uh, 150, 200 years old, then you've got something that looks more or less like uh, what a pre-settlement forest would look like. So I, I found a place online uh, with the uh, Parks and uh, Wildlife uh, Agency and I ran off to go find to, to go see it because I wanted to see these 250 year old trees they said that I'd be able to find. And and so <laughs> I got there and <clears throat> it has been it's been leveled in just the last oh, year or so. And I was I was just crushed. And and then a friend of mine, Dan Jones, in up in Huntsville, who's a, a He's a forest naturalist up there. He said, "Lee, there's this place, and it's right there next to Sam, uh, right there next to Sam Houston State Park." I went, oh, <laughs> so they're not they're not uh, 250 year old trees, but they are in excess of 100 years, and there's some of the oldest trees still standing in East Texas. And and so I, I didn't have the I didn't have the chance in in the midst of putting the show together to finish that painting, but here is a sketch that I that I would use in in doing the the actual painting. So uh, just to just to wrap up the talk, it, it's I, I really feel like I've been on on a, on a long trek in doing this because it's one I I felt a, a a responsibility to show what East Texas is and show how it is it's worthy of representation and it's full of, of rich uh, human people and just wonderful beautiful places but then on, on, on top of that it's also like any interaction with art it's an exploration into me by me and and I found out a lot of stuff about myself too. Uh, are are there any questions, or have I just talked your heads off? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I, I'm from the swampy area of East Texas. <clears throat> um, 
We went in East Texas part of it, driving up to Southwest Arkansas and spent time there. I had relatives that lived in East Texas and spent a lot of time there. And I heard all kinds of rather mysterious stories like the Sir Dakota lights and such that circulated among people that were particularly mysterious about magical things that would happen mm. as you were driving around. And sometime later, I started reading uh, the work of William Goyen, who grew up in Trinity, Texas, and went to Rice University in the 30s and studied literature and wrote. And uh, he uh, illustrated some of these uh, myths and stories that, in some of his books that tend to be on the supernatural side. Hmm. Um, uh, 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 the, I, I then later heard that when um, that the French pushed all the, the uncomfortable people that were in Louisiana out across the Spain <laughs> River into Spain, that they're still there. And, and, and uh, I, I know that I met some of these people. I remember going out in the thicket with my mother and my father to visit distant, distant cousins. And there were these five men, all brothers, living in this house out in the thicket spring water and all of that and uh, just living out there you know like on the land and i thought that was very very strange <laughs> and i still think it's very very strange <laughs> and by the way you went to long Mars. i think you were there when my son was there really yeah who was that stuff on stuff jamie hine was his roommate he's now um in the state department Okay, now I, I went from 75 to 77. Uh, well, you're the same age, so yeah. um, probably. Yeah. So he, it's, it, that's, that's possible. I didn't know everybody who was there. You there. <laughs> <laughs> Although I should have. Uh, <clears throat> I think these are beautiful paintings. Well, thank you. They're perfect, they're beautifully painted. <clears throat> Thank very you. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I love the stories too. Yeah. Well, and you know that with the with the business about each one of them having some some baggage, uh, that as I realized that I realized that I really I really need to needed to expose what that baggage was uh, because sometimes the paintings themselves wouldn't necessarily show you where they were coming from because there you know the the background story is kind of the well from which it comes but then but then if you're only looking at the glass of water at the end you haven't seen the whole thing anybody else we need to talk later <laughs> oh, yeah. i have to explain i have several of his paintings and I don't know what was going through your mind, but you must have been really depressed. Because <laughs> the <colors match. laughs> and I had no idea that asking you to paint these would cause so much tension and stress in your life. Oh, okay. But the colors that you use are, are amazing. And, and I look around and I see a lot of it here, but I wish I'd brought mine to show people because I think they're some of the best work you've done. And, uh, and one more, the painting of the three boys on the pier at Lake is my all time favorite. Yes. And you must have been stressed out painting that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm well, amazed I mean, there you there, say that, actually. Uh, well, uh, but that's not, you know, the, those boys actually were wearing bright colors. Yes, right. So that's, you know, part of it is that. But I, the, I, I didn't do, you know, psychedelic trees or anything. <laughs> well, there are, on my paintings, there are some colors that are a little closer to psychedelic. Okay. <laughs> yes, in the shadows you see purples and blues that I don't see. Yeah, watching you be painted, you know, when you post the post things, the colors that you use to ultimately get what we see was to amaze the layers. Well, thank yeah. you. I love the use of colors. Hey, I I'd love for you to talk a little bit about your process. Um, in this, you know, in this project, I know that you uh, went out and did sketches on side, and I want to kind of hear a little bit more about how you not only chose specific locations, but you know, you, did you use photography? Was it sketches? How? You know, kind of what's your walk us through a, a process? Well, in 
Now, several, several of these pieces came from uh, trips that were intentionally for gathering material for, for the paintings. So, uh, for example, uh, Martin Dye's State Park over there and, and this painting uh, both came out of the same trip. And in the process of, of doing that trip, uh, because that's, that's too compressed a time to just sit down and sketch for every single painting in, in that period of time. What I would do is uh, go to the location, kind of scout it out. Then when I found something that I thought would be a good subject, I would, I would take lots and lots of pictures. Uh, and in taking the pictures, well, I, love, I love digital photography because now I can take literally hundreds of pictures and uh, do things like bracketing the exposure so that in the dark areas I can have, I, I can have lots of subtlety of uh, light and shade and in the, in the brightly exposed areas I can have subtlety of, of shade and so forth. And, uh, and so I may, I may take the same picture four or five times so that I get all of that uh, worked out. And then I'll go back into the studio uh, when, when I've got material that's like that and I'll, and I'll work up sketches from those uh, series, a series of photographs. Uh, and then, you know, I would, for this show, I'd bring it down and, and show it to you guys and say, okay, which ones do you think you can, you, you want? Uh, but that's one, that's one way of doing it. And sometimes, you know, I'll, I'll do a sketch on the site. Sometimes I'll, I'll have uh, photographs that I took years ago that I'd always wanted to do something from, uh, <clears throat> but had, had not been able to just sit down and, and do, and that's one of the more interesting things because those are sometimes the things that haunt me most. Uh, to, to go back to a walk that I took uh, 10 or 15 years ago and, and see something that still speaks to me the way it did when I saw it in the field. Those, those are really meaningful in the painting process. Okay, I saw it. No, or not, I was saying. They may speak to you or they may not speak to you. But you have the photograph there and then you have your current, your memory and mm -hmm. the photograph and mm -hmm. then the actual thing that's there now. Well, and, and also, you know, another aspect of that is that uh, some, of, some of these landscapes, I've been driving past these landscapes for decades. Yeah. And, and I would... You know, the, the long one back there, the 30 by 60, that piece is one that I had been thinking to myself, I was going to paint a picture of that field someday since I was going to Long Morris. So that field, that field was really important to me for that reason, just because I would crest that hill and I'd see that vista and I'd go, wow, I like that. And and so the the there are these there are these few images that are like that 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 have just kept after me and kept after me and kept after me for years. Uh, the one to the lower left of that is another of those uh, of those that are also like that. That's on that that's on that uh, road on Highway 21, Kings Highway. Uh, that. That particular field has has always struck me, and I may have to paint it again sometime because I I don't it's that I'd always I, I realized I'd always seen it while I was moving, and so it was it was partially it was partially the way all the pieces interacted while you know you're moving you're seeing this thing in a three dimensional space, and I. And I wanted to, I, I, I want to get the sense on a painting 
of what that feels like to, to see that interaction of spaces. And then, you know, as, as, I was, as I was following that up and walking in there, I, I realized that, oh, wait a minute, it was a particularly hot day, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get this field just right, and there are all these black cattle sitting under the, uh, under the trees because it's too hot to be wearing black out in the sun. <laughs> I don't have a question. I have an observation. Uh, first of all, I thank you. First of all, this is, I agree with you. This is an incredible show. This is an incredible collection of works, and you did a fabulous job. And it's what you're taught. It was so wonderful to me uh, in terms of, it to me is the epitome of an artist talking, of a regionalist artist who is talking about their subject matter and an artist who uses regionalist material to really extend universal meaning and universal kinds of things. To me, this is something that everybody that has, I mean, in Texas, uh, it's a badge of honor to call yourself a regional artist. In Texas, it is. I'm not sure if it is. <laughs> but it still is in Texas. But to me, and then there are, there are no worthy artists that are in great museums from our state all over the you know, all over the country now, who wore that badge as a Texas regionalist, and you are a part of a group of contemporary Texas regionalists shown here in this gallery. But I've never heard talk of all the time that we've had here where an artist clearly showed their embrace, their deep understanding, their deep appreciation of the place that they are from and that they relate to, and put it on canvas and explain the the backdrop of everything to do with Richard Stout, and I talk about this all the time, about whether that painting uh, is the same as the painting that he paints, which is a much more abstract expression of mm -hmm. the same thing. And they are the same thing. And this talk today and what you've done yep. today was just so inspiring to me. So thank you for doing this. Uh, the only thing I'm leaving here today thinking is, this needs to be seen by so many people, not just in East Texas, but by Texans everywhere. Uh, oh, I agree. Yeah, I, just, I, just, I just think it's wonderful. Thank you very much. You did a great job. Both talk and the language. Thank you so much. This was so wonderful.